Hey, I'm Jenny, another member of Quadrant Developer Advocates team, which also doesn't have a nice recording background, but I hope you will forgive me. So, as you remember from day zero videos, in vector search you can use different kinds of vectors, even though the dense ones are the main characters here in Quadrant. Well, today we are going to talk about sparse vectors and how to use them. Sparse vectors are high dimensional vectors filled up with zeros except for a few dimensions. Each dimension in a sparse vector refers to a certain object and its value to a role of this object in this particular sparse representation. For example, think about a movie recommendation system. Each sparse vector could describe a particular user's opinion about movies in this system. Each dimension of a sparse vector, movies, and each value of these dimensions, a particular user's rating of this particular movie. To compare two sparse vectors, or two sparse representations, it would make sense to compare similar objects, for example, ratings of the same movie. And we have a perfect metric for that. If you remember from the day two, we were discussing dot product, a metric which, when comparing two vectors, multiplies their corresponding dimensions and then sums the values up. Well, sounds very much fitting. Now let's be practical. Does it make sense to compare zeros to zeros? Does it make sense even to store all of these zeros, considering that there are so many in sparse representations? Well, certainly not in a system optimized for scale. Let's get rid of these zeros then. Let's enumerate our objects, our dimensions, and give them indexes. Now we can store only indices of objects which have non-zero values, along of course with their values. Now the question arises how to compare these representations because for each time we want to compare an incoming vector with all of these representations, we need to find all matching indices and do it fastly. Well, it's possible due to a data structure organizing sparse vector elements within a database. If you remember from videos of day two, there is HNSW, a dense vector index. Well, sparse vectors also have their own index, which is called inverted index. And don't worry, it's much more simple than HNSW, because here we're just dealing with exact matches. Let's study inverted index on an example. Let's say we have three sparse vectors. Each of them has an ID, object indices of a non-zero dimensions, and their values, weights of these objects. Inverted index maps each object to all sparse representation where this impact of this object is not null. So basically this index inverts representations it maps all non-zero sparse vector dimensions to sparse vectors themselves. Now we have a new sparse vector incoming for comparison, and we can immediately look in the inverted index and spot all the vectors having the same non-zero value dimensions, six and seven. Now, to calculate similarity scores between vectors, what's left is to multiply values of each non-zero matching dimension for each vector, id1, id2, and id3, and then sum them all up as in dot product. And that's how inverted index allows for fast searches and comparisons within a big amount of vectors. Now you have an idea how sparse vectors are stored, represented and compared at scale. Let's see them in practice, in Quadrant. The setup we are going to use for this course is going to repeat from one video to another. We are going to use Quadrant Cloud and we are going to check our vectors in WebUI because this is just handy. So if you don't remember how to connect our client to Quadrant Cloud, which I'm doing here, or you don't to remember how to open our Cloud Dash, which is here, please check out videos from the day zero and you will get all the recommendations and all the instructions. Here I am using everything in the same way as it was done in the day zero. So let's just start working with sparse vectors in Quadrant. Sparse vectors are configured a little bit differently in Quadrant than dense vectors. Here we're using sparse vectors config, which doesn't require defining either size or distance metric. Size of sparse vectors depends on the amount of the non-zero elements in each sparse vector, so it can vary from vector to vector in the collection. And the distance metric we're using in Quadrant to compare sparse vectors is always dot product, the one we discussed before. We often get questions in our community, what is the maximum number of non-zero elements that a sparse vector in quadrant can have? And this number is limited by UIN32 type, which means that it can be more than over 4 billions. 
One last thing you need to know before creating a collection with sparse vectors, that sparse vectors are not default. That's why always, when you configure a collection with sparse vectors, you need to give them a name. Basically, all sparse vectors should be named vectors. But that's very simple. You can use any name. For example, here I am with very original mindset. Use the name sparse vector. And that's basically, that's how you pass it. That's how you use it. And that's how you configure sparse vectors in the collection. Let's see how it looks in our UI. Here it is, sparse vectors collection. Well, our example certainly didn't have too many parameters to configure, but there are still some that you can, and these parameters of sparse vectors are related to inverted index, which is used to organize sparse vectors in the database. And we have three parameters, but before I am going to proceed explaining them, I need to tell that the default parameters are actually pretty good to use in many use cases, so unless you have a certain idea why do you need to change inverted index parameters, just use the defaults. They're pretty good and they're going to work. The first one refers to the situation when we don't want to use inverted index for searching and comparing our sparse vectors until a certain amount of the sparse vectors in the database. I need to note that even though you use this parameter, inverted index in quadrant for sparse vectors is going to be always built no matter how many points you insert it, and no matter which value of this parameter you set up. This parameter, called on disk, is about where inverted index is stored. By default, it's stored in RAM, but you can also configure it to be stored on disk. This parameter, called data type, refers to a type of values, so non-zero weights of sparse vector dimensions, which are going to be stored in the index. You need to remember so no matter which data type you choose, the original values, so original non-zero weights, are also going to be stored in quadrant, just on disk. Here is the example of the collection with the configuration of inverted index. Here are all three parameters that you can change if you want to. These parameters here that I chose are only for the sake of example and are not anyhow a recommendation, but we can run this code and see how our collection is appearing in our UI. And even more, you can check the parameters of the custom index that you just passed here. And now let's return and check out how to insert sparse vectors in our collection and how to retrieve them. To insert sparse vectors in the collection, you need to represent them in the format accepted for sparse vectors in Quadrant. And it's pretty much exactly what I was explaining in the first part, which was more theoretical. We have indices, the non-zero indices of objects which matter in this sparse representation, and their values. Indices are represented through UIN32 values, so they can vary from zero to more than four billions, and values are represented as float. There are two important rules when creating sparse vectors in Quadrant and using them. Firstly, indices must be unique. And secondly, the length of indices array should be the same as the values array. Now let's see how we're going to insert two sparse vectors in our collection. Here is the first point with a sparse vector and the second one with IDs 1 and 2. And here we have our very originally named sparse vector, one of the length 3, and one of the length two with their corresponding non-zero values. As simple as that, let's insert them to the collection and once again check them out in the UI. Here they are, point one, point two, length three, length two. And you can also check out which are the similar ones. Here we don't have much choice, but you know, in the big collections it will matter. And also you can copy and see what vectors are here in the collection. Now it's time to run similarity search on our two-point collection and see how we can retrieve the most similar sparse vector to our query vector. The interface we're going to use is pretty much similar to the one that you saw in day zero for dense vectors. The only difference is how we are passing the query. Here is the sparse vector of two non-zero elements and that we're using the parameter, I'm sorry for tautology, using, which means that we're working with named vectors. So we're scoring our results against this specific sparse vector. Let's run the query and check our results. 
we are getting the point with ID 1 and the score is 0 0.4. Let's dig it out why the score is 0 0.4 and why it's the point that we are getting. And it will explain us also how dot product works for comparison of sparse vectors. So let's look at our examples. Why we got point 1 as an answer. In our collection we have two points. Point 1, which has three non-zero values with indices 1, 2 and 3. And point 2, which had two non-zero values with indices 1 and 5. Our query has indices 1 and 3 with corresponding non-zero values. Similarity score for sparse vectors is calculated only by comparing matching indices shared between query and the compared vectors. So for example with point 1 it's going to be both indices, one here and one here, and three here and three here. And with point 2 it's only going to be one here and one here. Five and three don't match. And when we just need to multiply corresponding values and sum them up Let's check it out, for example, for point 1. We look at the index 1, see the corresponding value 1, and here we look at the index 1, and see the corresponding value 0 0.2. Here is 1 by 0 0.2. Next, let's move to the index 3. Here is the corresponding value 1, and here we're moving at 3 and finding the corresponding value 0 0.2. Once again, 1 by 0 0.2. Here we're summing them up and we are getting 0 0.4. Analogously, we are comparing query and point 2, and the resulting score is 0 0.1, which is less than 0 0.4, that's why our topmost match is point 1, which we exactly got in our answer, as you remember, ID 1, score 0 0.4. Of course, you can do many more with sparse vectors, not only use a couple of indexes, you can combine them with filters, you can combine with them with dense vectors, and you can also use them for retrieval. That you are going to see in the further videos. For now, you know how to store, compare, and index sparse vectors in Quadrant. In the next video, I'm going to explain you how to use sparse vectors for text retrieval and where this method shines compared to or even combined with dense vectors. See you there!